Hi, my name is Loren, and I have the privilege of serving here on staff at Faith Church. It is our mission to help you discover and live out your spirit-empowered life. Thank you so much for joining us for today's message. Make sure you like or subscribe. We're going to jump right into the Word. So we're going to jump in the Word today. Uh, Luke chapter 14, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you, Lord, for your promises over us. Lord, as this word is this morning, I ask, Lord, that you would open our hearts to receive. We know, Father, that your word is always for our good. You, Lord, there's times you want to feed us milk. There's times you want to feed us meat. There's times you want to feed us things that we have to really digest and understand. And, Lord, I ask that you would give us an understanding heart, that we'd have ears to hear and eyes to see what your spirit is speaking to us. Open us up to receive the depths of your word and that we would become stronger in you every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. As I looked at the message and I was praying about it this week, I was reminded, if you missed last week, I encourage you to watch Pastor Darla's message. It was a great message on the shifts, the four shifts that she talked about that are important for us as we're stepping into. We believe God is really leading us into a revival atmosphere, a revival spirit. And I don't say that lightly because that's, that's a commitment that's deep, that's intense. And I understand that, but we really believe God's opening something that's fresh. And I don't want to miss an opportunity where God can move. I understand the difference between an outpouring and a revival. And there can be outpourings of God's presence, and there can be outpourings of God's Spirit where people can feel great and people can feel refreshed. And we certainly saw that a few months ago at Asbury where there was an outpouring. It was an outpouring. It wasn't a revival. It was an outpouring. And it was wonderful, and it was great. And I love outpourings, and we see those uh, here. But I believe God's calling us into a revival, which is, a, a community transformation. It's a transformation where souls are getting saved in abundance, where people's lives are being transformed by the power of God, not just here in our church, but in the community. And so it's, a, it's an intense um, process that God is taking us through as a church. And over the last few weeks, we've been talking about making room for revival. We've been talking about men of revival. We've been talking about shifts that need to take place in revival. And so today... I really believe that we need to understand the mind of God in regards to how does he want to do revival and what is our role in it. And so I want to title this this morning, Everything Belongs to God. Everything Belongs to God. And while that sounds great, there's a role that we play in this. And as part of the shifts and as part of the adjustments that I believe God's doing to this church, to this house, we have to take inventory of where we are. Where are we with God? And for some of us, you're, you're ready, you come in ready, you're excited. Even the beginning of service, I'm seeing more prayer. Monday nights, we've been having over 100 people at every prayer meeting. We're seeing God come, we're seeing God move. There's a hunger, and revivals always has a hunger attached with it. There's got to be a hunger for the things of God, a hunger for a move of God. And we're seeing that hunger start to take place and the greater measures in our church, in our congregation. Revival isn't hinged upon just me. It's hinged upon us as a church, as a body of believers, and what our role is in it. I also recognize there's people that are maybe new, new to the church or new to Christ, and you're still figuring things out, and I understand that. Some that are maybe standing in between. You don't know where your relationship with the Lord is, but I want to encourage you today. The Lord knows where you are, and the Lord loves you, and wants to bring you into the next season that he has for you. Everybody walks in certain seasons. I walk in seasons, you walk in seasons. Seasons of growth, seasons of opportunity. And as a church, we corporately walk into a new season. And so we're asking God that we don't want it to be religious. I'm not interested in being religious. I'm not interested in doing something God's not interested in doing. I want it to be pure. I want it to be holy. I want it to be righteous. And I want it to be God doing it all and using a church, using a body of believers. But as he's doing that, that means there's got to be a surrendering of ourselves to him, a surrendering of our lives to him. And in Luke chapter 14, Luke chapter 14, and I'm going to read one verse in 14, and I'm going to jump over to Luke 16. 
But Luke chapter 14, Jesus is teaching what it means to be a true disciple. He's teaching the disciples. And whenever Jesus teaches, I think, personally, I think Jesus' words are very weighty. I think they're very heavy. I think they can be sometimes hard to digest. I mean, even in John 6, where you see all the disciples looked at Jesus and they walked away because it was too deep. There's times when Jesus' words are just deep. And you're trying to digest it. And unfortunately, the people, uh, the disciples in John 6, they said, what? I, I can't handle all this. And the only ones left were the, were the 12 disciples. And Jesus said, are you going to go too? He goes, well, where are we going? We've already given up everything. And that is true. When you're really a disciple of Christ, you really have to have the mindset, I'm willing to give up everything for Christ. I'm willing to give up everything. And not everybody's there. Not everybody's there in the first service. Not everybody's going to be there in the second service. But it's an important question to process. If I really want to be a disciple of Christ, what does this mean? If we really want to see God perform healings and miracles and deliverance and salvations and signs and wonders, if we really do want to see that, what is the cost? Because Jesus says there's a cost to following him. That's why whenever I give an altar call for salvation, I don't make it easy. I do that on purpose because I want you to understand there's a cost. There's a cost. You're going to have to change some things in your life. If you really want to serve Christ, you're going to have to make a change in some things. But he can help us, and he will help us. The Holy Spirit will help us. None of us are perfect. None of us get it right all the time. But we want to have a heart that is so sensitive to God that when we do go sideways, that he brings us back in and we're quick to repent. And so in Luke 14, 33, he says these words. He says, so you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. He says, you cannot become my disciple unless you give up everything you own. And I want to say that from the aspect of mentally, emotionally, spiritually, every way, financially, everything relationally, everything belongs to Jesus. Everything belongs to God. Am I willing to give up everything? Maybe there's relationships. Maybe there's career goals. Maybe there's places that I want to live or move. Maybe there's jobs I want, promotions. Maybe, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just your time, your life. Am I willing to give up everything to follow Jesus? Am I really willing to do that? Am I willing to count the cost? And so Jesus talked about it in Luke 15, and I'm not going to read any of these verses in 15, but you're familiar, many of us are familiar with the passages in Luke 15. Jesus talks about the parable of the lost sheep and how one got away, one of his sheep got away, and he went and chased that one. I believe that is the heart of Jesus. He will chase us to come back home. And he said at the end of that, he said, and that sheep came back and repented. So it's talking about us. He see the next one, it says the parable of the lost coin, where there was a coin that was owned by Jesus, and it was lost as of great value. But when it was found, again, he uses these words, it repented. So it's more than, it's not money, it's a person that's of great value. It repented. And then he talks about the lost son. And we see that, we refer to it many times as the prodigal son. But the lost son but this one was a little different. This one, Jesus said the father let the son go and didn't chase him. He stayed and waited for the son to return. It's a little different intensity. I believe the father sometimes allows us to go and do our thing and wait for us to come back home. The Holy Spirit will keep speaking, come on home, come on home, come on home. But the Father is waiting for us. Sometimes we think, well, God, will you just pull me out of sin? And he says, you have to want to get out of sin. You have to want to get out of those things. If you don't want to get out of it, God isn't going to take you against your will. If you, don't want, if you want to sin, you can sin. And, and the truth is, over 365 days of the year, there are times when any of us can sin. 
There's times when any of us can say something wrong. We can have a wrong heart. We can be negative. We can hold unforgiveness. We can, we can complain. We can, we, can, we can do other things that are absolutely sinful. And so we have to have a tender heart to always return and repent to God. It's important that we have a heart of repentance. But that repentance means that not only do I want to come back to God, I want to give God everything. And that might mean there's some things I need to give up completely. There's some things other people may be able to handle you can't handle. And so am I willing to give up? And am I willing to become the son? Because the son lost everything. He lost all his money. He lost all his friends. He lost everything. You know, a lot of people will be your friend when you got money. Oh, you're paying? I'll go. Where are we going? But as soon as you're out of money, they're, they, they're, they're out of your life. And so you have to find the understanding that God loves you regardless of whatever you have. He cares about you whether you got little or you got much. And so not only do we see the parable of the lost son, but he takes us into Luke 16 is where I want to spend some time this morning. I want to spend all of our time in Luke 16. And Luke 16 is very intense. Luke 16 is one of those passages that I have, to, I have to wrestle with because it's not the same vibe as Luke 15. It doesn't have the same vibe. It doesn't have the same feel. It's got a whole different feel. And, and for my, as long as we're talking about parable of lost things, see, Jesus is interested in lost things. He's interested in lost people. He's interested in lost disciples. He wants them to come back home. But as long as we're on this theme of lost things, my title for this would be the parable of the lost servant. Lost steward. He was a steward of God's resources, but he went sideways. But how Jesus treats the steward is different than the way he treated the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. Stewardship is a, is a powerful word, and, and it includes major responsibility. When I say I'm going to be a steward, like if you look at me and say, Pastor, I want you to oversee my bank account. Like, nobody's going to do that. But if you did that, I can barely oversee my bank account. I'll leave it right there. And my own home. But if you said that, I would have to take responsibility for what you're spending. I'd have to take responsibility for your finances. I'd have to take responsibility to make sure that you are solvent, to make sure that you are doing the right things. And when he talks about the parable of the law steward, that means not only with finances, that means with time. What, how am I stewarding my time? How am I stewarding my relationships? How am I stewarding my life? How am I stewarding my career? Again, everything belongs to God. And if everything belongs, when I come to God, I'm saying, God, I give you my life. Some people come to God and say, God, will you save me so I don't go to hell? That's the wrong mindset. God wants to save you from going to hell, but in order to serve him, you must count the cost. Am I really willing to give him my life? Am I willing to give up relationships that aren't good in my life? Am I willing to give up careers that God doesn't want me to have? Am I willing to give money? Am I willing to serve? Am I willing to give up time, pray, and do the things? You know, some people say, well, I don't have time to pray. You have time. You have time. You just have to be willing to give up time and other things to put time in with God. We all have time. I guarantee you, show me your schedule. I'll show you time. So we all have time. You're just not a good steward. Now that hurts. Tell somebody next to you, it's tight, but it's right. <laughs> it's okay. You know, one of the greatest things is for us to realize when we're not good at something that God wants to help us become better. I'll be the first one to raise my hand. They're saying, there's things I'm not good at stewarding in my life. There's things that I, I struggle with. There's things that I'm working on. 
And God's faithful to help us get on track with those things. Some of you might be great stewards in one area, but you struggle in other areas. And it's not that God's upset at you, but there has to come a realization, am I willing to become the steward he wants me to be? If I'm going to step into a new season, if we're going to step into um, a new way of living, am I willing to become the steward? Because that's what I am. I'm a steward. Am I willing to become that steward that he wants me to be? Verse 1 of Luke chapter 16. So Jesus is teaching and he says, and he said this to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who has a steward. That rich man is God. And the steward is us, people, disciples. And an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be a steward. So God is evaluating, let me stop there. God is evaluating our time. He's evaluating our life. He's evaluating the way we think, our thought life. He's evaluating our finances. He's evaluating our serving, our witnessing, our, our everything, relationships, everything. God's evaluating. And if God was to call you up directly and you stood in front of God, and he was to ask you about your time, how would you answer? How good a steward are you with your time? How good a steward are you with your relationships? How good a steward are you with your career? How good a steward are you with your finances, with your giving? How good a steward are you with your serving? How good a steward are you with your ministry, the things God's called you to do? And, and this is a sobering message. This is a hard message because Jesus doesn't hold back with his disciples. He's very clear with them that I'm going to make you accountable for your life. We can see this in other passages. You're going to have to show you've been faithful to God. You have to show, you know, remember, when we get to heaven, the words we want to hear is, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't know, and I say this very sincerely, I do not know how God will handle people who slide into heaven. I'm using your words. I don't know how God will handle that. All I know is there's a scripture that says he'll have mercy on whom he'll have mercy. But I don't know what that means. I don't know how he'll handle those of us that should know better but aren't willing to do better. I don't know what God will do. I'm glad I'm not God. Tell the person next to you, I'm glad you're not God. I think we already heard that once this morning. I'm glad you're not God. Because some of you would already have me in hell probably already. I'm glad he's the righteous judge. If God was to call you up and give you give an account of your relationships, how would you answer? If he was to kind of call you up and give an account of your money, how would you answer? Your giving, how would you answer? If you were to give an account on your serving, how would you answer? If he was going to call you up and, and you had to give an account on your prayer life, how would you answer? I'm not saying this in condemnation. I'm saying this in evaluation. I, I, I always appreciated somebody who would preach and it would make me think. Because I want to grow. And I want to continue to move forward. I don't want just to eat candy every day. Well, I do. But I don't. Some of us enjoy spiritual candy. Can you just get to the fun stuff? 
And we like the spiritual candy, and we just want to see the healings and the miracles, and it's awesome, but we don't want to pay the price for it. And paying the price for it is actually hard. It's not that God doesn't want to do stuff, but there's a price. He says, count the cost. So if he's saying count the cost, there's a price tag. Why do I need to count something if there's no price tag? And the price tag is me. It's my time. It's my willingness. Am I willing to give God everything? Or am I willing to give God most things? Or am I willing to give God some things? Even my phone. Am I willing to give God my phone? (laughs) <laughs> Sorry. I don't know who that was. I'm not looking. You know what? Maybe that was from the Lord. Am I willing to give God my phone? Hmm. If you had to give an account for your phone. Your social media. Here's the thing. You will have to give an account. And I have to realize that everything belongs to him not because he wants to be controlling, but because he wants to use us for his glory. I'm just here on assignment. When my assignment's over, I'll be gone. I don't want to get to heaven and God say, why didn't you do X? Why didn't you do Y? I don't want to say, well, you know, I had a wife and I had kids and I had this career and, you know, church people, you know how they are. I don't want to, (laughs) I'm just kidding. But I don't want to make excuses. But this passage is interesting because Jesus doesn't let him make excuses. In fact, Jesus gets a little rough. Verse 3, then the steward said within himself, so the steward is already knows he's, he can't beat God. He can't talk himself out of God. So his steward says, what should I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I can't dig. I don't want it. In other words, I don't want to work hard. And I'm ashamed to beg, and I've got too much pride. Meaning, I don't want to repent. The steward did not want to repent. You know, there's sometimes we do things and we know it's not right and we don't want to repent. That's a scary situation. When you know what you're doing is not right and you, that one thing, you just don't want to repent. Please understand the difference between I'm sorry versus repentance. I'm sorry, Lord. Repentance means I'm willing to change. I'll do what it takes to change. And God will help you change if you're willing to change. And sometimes we're just sorry, but we're not willing to change. And he was too ashamed, he had too much pride. He knew he was in trouble, but he didn't want to change. And I've seen in my lifetime this deadly spirit of pride that'll take people out, even of the body of Christ. People that were once serving Christ no longer serve Christ. People that once loved the Lord They don't even talk to the Lord anymore. People that once were serving or tithing or giving no longer want to do those things, no longer want to be a witness for Christ, no longer want to talk. To me, that's a scary situation, but I've seen it. 
where people have gone away. And my prayer is that somehow, some way, at some point, they come back. But here's what I know. Not everybody does. I can prove it to you with Judas. Judas didn't. Judas was sorry, but he died a broken man. There's some that die in their rebellion. And for me, that's a weighty... When I look at this passage, and Jesus is not giving this guy a quick out. You know, sometimes we give ourselves a quick out. We've got to be careful. Verse 4. So here's what the steward decided. He said, I've resolved what to do. So that when I'm put out of the stewardship, that they may receive me into their homes. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, how much do I owe my master? And he said, 100 measures of oil. So he said to him, well, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, 100 measures of wheat. And he said, well, take your bill and write 80. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly for the sons of this world are more shrewd than in their generations than the sons of light. Let me be careful here. Some people read this fat passage and go, oh, well, Jesus was commending him. He was commending him that he had a plan B. But notice the steward still wasn't repenting. The steward just says, well, if I'm going to blow it with God, I might as well make friends with the world, so at least I have money coming in. At least I have provision. At least I have a home to stay. If I can't stay in my master's house, I can stay with somebody because... I'll be kind to them. I'll help them get out of their trouble. And then because I help them get out of trouble, I have plan B, I'll stay with them. I'm not repenting. Verse 9, though. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you, when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Jesus is not encouraging them to go and make friends with unrighteous mammon, unrighteous wealth. That's what that is. Unholy wealth. He's not encouraging them to do it because notice what he says. When you fail. Those words are right in the middle. When you fail, at least you'll have a place to stay. So if you're going to do it, go ahead, go and make friends with the world. Go ahead and make friends with the world. Do what you think is going to be great to make sure that you're putting yourself in position to have a place to stay and having somebody that you think cares about you, you're being deceived because when you fail, he knows that sometimes we put too much hope in our worldly relationships. We put too much Stock in our worldly uh, achievements. I've got this great job. i got this great career. You know how much money i got in the bank. You know how much stocks I've got. You know all the things, the houses I've got, the lands I've got. You know all the people that I know. We put stock in the worldly, unrighteous mammon. Thinking that somehow that's going to save us. I promise you, God can snatch it like that. You invest 20 years ago all your money in Blockbuster Video? I promise you got nothing left. You invest into something like what was it, the Titan that went down the other last week so sadly? Their stocks did not go up. In a moment, a nation can lose everything. That's why America's pride is deadly. Because in a moment, America can be taken down. But we're so proud, and we're willing to keep pushing the envelope. We're willing to keep pushing the debt limits. We're willing to keep doing the same. We, you won't stop us. If we don't have enough money, we'll just make more money. Thinking that somehow our intelligence, 
and our trust in unrighteous mammon will end up landing on our feet. We keep going the way we're going. It's going to all crumble sooner or later. I take no comfort in what our government does. I take no comfort in our banking system, in our treasury system. I take no comfort in the world's ways of doing things. He says, if you put your trust in worldly mammon, worldly money, you're putting your trust in worldly systems, unrighteous systems, you think they're going to hold up for you, they won't. It's only a matter of time. That's why stewardship to Jesus was so important. He didn't come quick and say, yep, you're fine. He let this thing play out. And sometimes when we struggle with stewardship, we don't understand why God's letting it play out. Because there's something within us that isn't willing to surrender what God is asking for from us. He could be asking for a relationship you don't want to give up. He could be asking for a career you don't want to give up. He could be asking for a ministry that he wants you to do that you don't want to do. And you keep putting your trust in all these things. God can cause it to be gone like that. In fact, I would suggest that what he allowed for the prodigal son was his mercy. That young man lost everything. And then he remembered his father's house. And he came back in repentance and was not only forgiven, was restored. It's amazing Jesus takes that story and leads it right into this story. Right behind the prodigal son, coming home, repenting for wanting to do his own thing, taking all the money, not caring about his calling, not caring about his assignment, not caring about his family, not caring about the things that God had set in store. He went and did his own way. And it's amazing, right before this story, he talks about how the prodigal came to the end of himself and came home and repented. The body of Christ, as we're talking about stepping into revival, God's going to require more of us. You're going to have to pray more. And I know some people get mad at me for saying that. I'm not trying to be judgy. I'm trying to be realistic. The enemy's going to try to take you out. You're going to need more time in prayer. You're going to need more time with the Lord. The enemy is not going to try to make this easy. The enemy isn't looking at our church going, oh, you guys want a move of God? I'll leave you alone. He's coming. And he's going to try to steal everything you're sowing. He's going to try to take away from you everything that you're investing into. He's going to try to keep a move of God. He's not interested in the move of God. And so we have responsibility to steward our lives better. That's what this is about this morning. How do I steward my life better? And I'm speaking from one that God is dealing with still on stewarding my life. I'm not perfect. I don't get it right every day. But I have to have a tender enough heart. Because sometimes we get a little proud and we go, well, I'll never get it right, son. Why try? That's pride. Jesus can help you get it right. The things we listen to, the things we watch. It has to change. We have to shift our mindset on wealth, especially how we think about worldly wealth, what's valuable. I don't care what the world thinks. I just don't. I don't care if they like me. I don't care if they like what I wear. I don't care if they like my family. I don't care if they like our church. I don't care. I'm not here to impress. I, don't, I genuinely do not care if any politician walked in these doors. I would not change what I'm preaching for a politician. I don't care. 
I know plenty of pastors who would. They've told me they would. In fact, they changed the way they preach because they want politicians. I want a move of God. I want God to be pleased. I have one king. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the only one I'm looking to please. All the other kings got to bow their knee too because there's only one king of all kings. Jesus goes on in verse 10 and says, He who is faithful with what is least is faithful also in much. He who is unjust in what is least is also unjust in much. Therefore, if you have been not faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? He was faithful with little. He can trust with much. Now let me poke at something. I'm poking at a lot of things this morning. I've heard a number of people said, I could count them on more than my hands and my toes, my fingers and my toes combined. Probably dozens upon dozens of people have said, well, you know, if I had more, I'd give more. Would you? If you have less, will you give less? If you have what you have, will you give what you have? He who is faithful with little, he will give much. So the little you do have, are you faithful with the little you do have? Well, you know, if I had more, I'd give more. And let me just cover my bases here. Yes, money's one of those things, but so is time. So are relationships. So is serving, ministry, things that God wants you to do, people that God wants you to help. Those are all a part of that. Well, you know, if I had more time, I'd pray more. You do have more time. You could pray more. You could spend more time with the Lord. Well, you know, if I had more time, I'd spend more time. If I had more time, I'd spend more time with my family. You could. You might not get as much sleep, but you could. Well, you know, if I had more, more money, I'd give more money. Are you faithful with the little? Because if you're not faithful with the little, why are you asking God for more? Why would God give you more if you're not even willing to give less? We like to say, well, if God gave me a million dollars, I'd give a million. No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't even, you're not even giving the one dollar you got in your pocket. We always like to commit to something we don't have. Well, you know what I would do? I doubt it. Well, no, if I was you... And if that was my situation, you know those people who always say that? Well, if that was my situation, if that was my wife, if those were my kids, you know what I'd tell them? No, you don't. You probably wouldn't tell them. You don't know what you would say. Everybody's got the answers when it's not their problem. And don't think it's easier to give, and let's just stay with money for a minute, and this isn't an offering message. It's really not. But don't think it's easier to give money when you're rich than it is when you're poor. Giving is not a matter of how much you have. Giving is based on the spirit that's in you. So if the spirit in you is a giver, you'll give whether you got little or much. There's people who have much that aren't good givers either. There's people with little. Who don't, there's other people with little. They give to the Lord everything he asks. Because they understand it all belongs to him. There's people who have much, and they understand it all belongs to him. And so if they have much, they're willing to say, God, whatever you want. Oh, you want me to give you that whole stock? I'll give you that whole stock. Oh, you want, me to, you want to take that whole Bitcoin? I'll give you the whole Bitcoin. God, you want to take my whole savings? I'll give you my whole savings. When God, if that is in your heart, and I believe God is going to require of that more from us, not only finances, but God's going to require more time of us, more prayer time, more time witnessing. I want you to go over and talk to your neighbor about Jesus. Well, if I had time, you listen, he's outside, you just got home, but I'm really tired. I know you're tired, but you just said if you have more time. I just gave you 10 minutes to go over and talk to your neighbor about Jesus. 
yeah, I don't know. I'm really not feeling it. That's the problem. You're not feeling it. Why do you have to feel it to be obedient? Why do we have to feel it? Well, if I really felt it, I'd, I'd volunteer and I'd serve somewhere. Why do you have to feel it? Just serve. Well, if I, if I really felt it, I'd give more. Why do you have to feel it? Just give. If God's telling you I want that, then give it. Why does it have to be wrapped up in your feelings? You know why it's wrapped up in your feelings? Because everything else is wrapped up in your feelings. You go to the store, you see that new shoes, you're like, I'm feeling these shoes. <laughs> I do that. I go to the store, I'm feeling this ice cream. I'm feeling chocolate, chocolate chip. I'm really feeling it now. But when you live by feelings, you're not going to be a good steward. Because you're going to live by feelings in a relationship with your spouse, but what if you feel something for somebody else? Now where are your feelings? You don't have that choice. Well, you can't help who you love. Sure you can. I can help who I love. I can help who I don't fantasize about. I don't have to think that way. I can submit myself to my right mind, right thinking. I don't have to fantasize about somebody. But when you give yourself to unrighteous mammon, you think that everything the world says is okay. You think it's okay for them to say, well, you can't help who you love. So if they, have, if they love little boys or they love little girls or they love the same boys or the same girls or they love this or they love that, and then you can't help it because you give too much stock into worldly mammon. And that's Jesus. Understand, this is stewardship. I have to give an account my thoughts, my actions, Am I willing to give them whatever? There's times God has asked me for stuff I didn't want to give them. I'll say this, and I apologize if this offends you. I probably should have said that at the beginning. <laughs> but there's, if you, there's going to be times in your walk with God that he's going to ask you for something that you won't want to give. It's a test. It's a test. He has to test you at some point. Are you willing to give me that relationship? Are you willing to give me that money? Are you willing to give me that career? Are you willing to give me that location? I want to move you to another location. I want you to take on a lesser job. I want you to take on... Are you willing to give up something? There's going to be times when you're going to be at a crossroads internally going, I, I don't want to give this. Why is it within me that I don't want to give this? I, like I, Some of you were here a few years ago when God told me to sell my van for first fruits. And he said, I want you to sell your van and I want you to give all the proceeds, all the income for, for, um, for first fruits. And I'm like, all right, it's a few thousand dollars. That's fine, I'll, I'll do that. And in my mind, I'm like, yeah, that's fine, until I went to sell it. I'm like, I don't want to sell this. I love this van. And God looked at me and said, that's the problem. You've made an idol. Some of us have made idols out of relationships, people, status, job, titles, positions. Well, I just got this title. I'm now this title. And look at this promotion I got. And God says, yeah, I don't want you to have that. And not that he wants to take something away, but he knows if you're willing to give, he'll give you the greater. Relationships. When I was dating, obviously before I was married, when I was dating, and God said, I want that relationship. I want you to give up that girl. And my spirit said, yes. 
And my flesh said, no, no, no. But my spirit was like, yes. And my flesh was like, but who am I going to have? And I look around the church. <laughs> Are you sure? I didn't know no Darla. The only Darla I knew was on the Little Rascals. It's true. This was before I went to Bible school. And my flesh wasn't happy. And I didn't see the future. And sometimes that step of faith means you're not going to see the future. But you know that God said it. And you know if you're obedient, God will reward you for your faithfulness. But it's hard because it's stewardship. And you look and you say, I'm a grown adult. I'll do what I want. I'm grown. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And that's the problem. God can't even tell you what to do. And he says, I'm looking at stewards. And he says, I want to give you much, but you can't even handle little. So how am I going to give you much when you can't even handle little? Because I know if you're unjust with little, you're going to be unjust with much. He says it right there in verse 10. If you have not been faithful with unrighteous mammon, who will commit and trust true riches? What's that mean? Every dollar we get, American dollar, any other dollar, currency, is, is unrighteous. What makes it righteous is when it's the Lord's. So if I'm not faithful, let's just take money for an example. If I'm not faithful with money, I'm not faithful to give God what is his. Why would he give me true riches? What are true riches? Giving me the spiritual gifts. Gifts of healings and miracles. Words from the Lord. Some people say, I want to hear from God. But you, you can't even give. What belongs to God? If I want true riches, true riches are those mysteries from God, those revelations, those insights, those things where God just begins to download things to me because he can trust me. He hits us hard. And I want to be one that gets true riches because to me, this, this stuff's all passing away. True riches is what I get from God that presence of God, the true riches of his glory, the true riches of his presence. I want that. I, if, I, if we're gonna, the true riches are revival. If we're going to have revival, are we willing to give everything to have it? Then he goes on and says the last two verses here. And if you've not been faithful, what is another man's? Who will give you what is your own? In other words... If you can't help make somebody else successful, nobody's going to help make you successful. You know, some people have a real issue. They only want to work for themselves or they only want people to work for them. You look at some people, and they're like, well, I've, you know, I've got this career and I want everybody to help me. But are you willing to make somebody else rich? Are you willing to pour into somebody else? Are you willing to bless somebody else? Or is it at the end of the day, is it still always about you? Because some people don't know how to make somebody else successful. What do I mean by that? Well, you clock in at nine and you clock out at five. Well, that's not my job. I know it's, it's a mess, but I don't care. It's not my company. Your mindset should be, I want to make this company successful at every level. I want to help this company grow. I want to help this company move forward. If that means I need to work overtime without pay. Oh, God. <laughs> what? If that means that i got to help outside of my area that's not on my job description, I don't even know who will do that anymore. It's not my job description. If you're not willing to help somebody else succeed, you're not going to have anybody help you. I'm just, I'm quoting Jesus. Well, I don't like Jesus' words. Neither do I. 
I wrestle with his words at times too because they're hard. And then he says this final verse. No servant can serve two masters. For either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is a spirit. Mammon is a spirit that will speak to you, say, serve me, serve me, serve me. Mammon is a spirit that when you go to give, mammon will say, you can't afford to give. Mammon is a spirit that speaks to us. When you go to pray, you, you'll come up with other things to do, worldly things. When you have relationships, anything in life, it's a spirit that keeps you from doing what God wants you to do. You have to recognize that you can't serve both. You can't serve the will of the enemy and the will of God at the same time. It's not possible. Well, I'll do my thing and I'll do God's things. You can't. You say, well, does that mean that we all got to quit our jobs and do? No, that's not what that means. Because for, some, for most of us, you are exactly where God wants you, but you need to have a different mindset of why you're there. You're there to fulfill his will. You're there to fulfill his purpose. You're there to bring blessings. You're there to grow and be a steward of the gifts God's given you. If God's given you a gift and you're a doctor or a teacher or a lawyer or whatever you're doing, maintenance, I don't care what it is, whatever you're doing, do it as though it's your own business. Make it succeed, make it fly, and God will reward you, and God will bless you. Well, why? You know, Pastor, I'm okay. I don't need more. I, I got enough in my life. No, you do need more. The kingdom of God needs more. God wants to do more, and he needs you. Because it frustrates me, and I'm probably going to say this a million more times. It frustrates me when people only think about themselves. Well, you know, Pastor, I think I'm good. I remember years ago, we had a pastor come through, a great man of God. His name is Bill Winston. And he preached here a few times, a couple times. And some of our congregation got so mad at him. And I remember he got up one day and he said, you need to have a six-bedroom house. And people were like, that is terrible. Well, what if you got six kids? What's wrong, what's wrong with a six-bedroom? Why is a two-bedroom better than a six-bedroom or a three-bedroom? Why are you on how many bedrooms? People got all upset. And I remember saying to somebody, and they didn't have, they didn't have any children in their house anymore. They said, that's terrible. I said, well, maybe God wants you to adopt. And they kind of put their head down. See, it's not about you. And I don't believe everybody needs a six-bedroom house. I'm making a point that some people, all you think about is you. God may want you to have a little bigger house. Maybe he does have somebody he wants to come, you to take in and live with you without charging them. I know. I, I finally crossed the line this morning. You know, there's people that need help all the time. The Bible tells us to take care of the poor and the widows. I work on that all the time. I'm always trying to take care of people. I'm not looking to be paid. I'm not looking to get my cut. I'm not even looking to make a business out of it. I'm looking to be a, a, a man that God can use to help others. Why do you always have to be paid? If God can't trust you with the lesser, how is he going to give you the greater? And he says, you can't serve mammon and God. And you can't. The saddest part of this to me is I don't see any place where the servant came back to God. Stewardship's a big deal. This lost steward I don't know if he ever made it home. And I know Jesus spoke in parables. But I do know this. There are lost stewards who never come back home. That I know. I've seen that through my lifetime. I've seen lost stewards who were given much. God had blessed them. 
and they squandered it, or they went the way of the world. You can't serve God and worldly wealth, worldly ideals. You can't serve successfully. You can pretend to serve, but it's not going to work. I've got to shift my mindset. Everything belongs to God. So if he asks for it, am I willing to give it? Let's stand this morning. I want to pray for a couple of things. I'm going to do two altar calls this morning. So just stay with me for a few minutes. The first altar call is this. Just bow your heads. Close your eyes. You don't know Jesus Christ. Or you're not serving Christ. You know you're not serving Christ. But today you're counting the cost and saying, I want to give my life to Christ. I know he loves me unconditionally. And I want to serve him with all my heart. I'm willing to change and become who he wants me to be. If that's you, will you just slip up your hand as a sign of saying, yes, I want to give my life to Christ today. Pastor, will you pray for me? I want to give my life to Christ. Balcony on the floor. If that's you, in the next 10 seconds, will you just come down real quick? Just come down front. We'll wait for you. You're not becoming a member of the church. You're just giving your life to Christ. You're saying, I want to give my life to Christ. If you're in the balcony, if you're on the floor, you want to give your life to Jesus Christ. You say, I know I'm a sinner. Maybe you've been in the church, but you're not really serving Christ. Not really. It don't matter what anybody thinks. This is you and God. You want to come down real quick in the next few seconds. Give your life to Christ. If anybody does, I want you to come down and see me right down front. Here's the second call. And I'll make it to everyone, but I know everyone won't respond. But I want you to process the question. You know that you want to be the type of Christian that God owns everything. God owns everything. Everything in my life, my time, my relationships, my finances, anything God asks for, either I'm already giving it or I want to. I want to be a person. I want to be a good steward. I want to be a good steward. Remember what he says. Well done, good and faithful servants, stewards. That's what he's talking about. And you say, I want to be a faithful steward. If that's you, I want you to come down and I want us to pray together. I'm not expecting everyone to come down. But it wouldn't surprise me if 50 or 100 people come down and say, I want to be a good steward. I want to be a good steward for God. I want to live my life for God that is honorable in every way. I want to pray when he tells me to pray. I want to give when he tells me to give. I want to witness when he tells me to witness. I want to be bold when he tells me to be bold. If he tells me to move, I want to move. If he tells me to go witness to my friend, I want to witness to my friend. I want to be that man. You're not going to be perfect. I'm not talking about perfection. You won't be perfect. But your tenderness of heart is perfect. You have a tender heart that you know that if you don't do it, you'll want to make it right with God. It's a big question. It's a hard question. Just continue to move in if you can. I'm not going to lay hands on everyone. So just come up a little bit and let people get in behind. But you know you want to be a good steward. And I realize some of us are thinking about it. I understand that. And it's okay. It's okay to be processing it. Not coming to the front doesn't make you a bad person. That's not what it means. It means you're really thinking about it. And you're really processing it. And you need to keep coming. And you need to keep asking the Lord to show you how. Maybe you know there's some things you need to give up. Even at this altar today. 
you know there's some things God's already asking me for. I know I got to give it up. And if that's you this morning, we're going to spend some time in prayer. We're going to spend some time in worship. How great is our God. Sing with me how great. Thank you so much for watching this video. We pray that it encouraged and blessed you. We invite you to check out more of our content. Make sure you subscribe to our channel. We'll see you soon.